Okay, good afternoon. Week five, and this is the program we continue in our examination of this peculiar science fiction novel by Jules Verne, worldwide famous French author who often focused on his narratives on new technologies. This time, it's an automobile, although it's much more than an automobile since it can fly, go on water, and underwater. We've already discussed how, from the point of view of the consideration of the technology and the themes, the social messages built into the narrative, there is a negative representation of the new technology driven by a moralistic view of the world and society. Humanity is not ready for this kind of technology. And keep in mind the data, the mindset of the author and many of his readers as well. We said he was born in 1828. Can you imagine someone born during that era facing the radical, dramatic changes that industrial society went through during the 19th century. Even for us, think back, it's about 200 years. How much has the world changed? And instead, if you go back 200 years from the date of birth of this French author, 1628, how many more things people had in common? 1628, 1828, you're talking in Europe about agricultural societies. 1628 was before the era of industrialization. By 1828, industrialization was an important component of society, but not a dominant component. And for another hundred years, it was pretty much the same in many ways. Because really, before mechanization impacted agricultural practices and techniques, which really didn't happen in most places until the late 1920s, the 1930s and 40s, and then of course, the post-war era with an abundance of vehicles of all kinds available at cheaper prices, so a, a great revolution. It wasn't until more recently that a large segment of society didn't change their practices. Even in my personal life and the memories I received from my parents, my father was born in 1927, and as a kid, he was sent to, during the summer, to help an uncle of his called Torello in the countryside of my hometown. And he would always say how his uncle Torello had a brother. They were both living in the same farm, as it was customary to have an extended family or multiple families living in the same farm and work in the same land. And when they sat at the table, these two brothers, Torello and his brother, had eight kids each. So there were 20 people, the couples and their kids, around the table. They all worked the land. Because without mechanization, you need a lot of people in order to take care of an agricultural property and make it profitable. So a lot of things did not change until very recently. And in general, during the 19th century, intellectuals, as well as politicians, both from the right, for sure, but even some on the left wing of the spectrum, didn't really believe that people could change and adapt to a new ecosystem 
dominated by technologies or a social context, a job market where more and more jobs were assigned to services that required the performance of intellectual tasks, right? Employees, administrators at various levels. During the 19th century, a lot of people thought that those from the lower classes who work the most menial jobs in the cities or worked these estates in the agricultural regions were there really because nature did not endow them with the qualities to do anything else. They, a lot of people during the 19th century, up until the end of the 19th century, throughout Europe, did not believe in education simply because they thought that a lot of people in society shouldn't go past an elementary set of skills, low-level reading and writing, and that any commitment of social resources to educate the majority of people in society past a third grade or a fifth grade education would be a waste of money because not everyone can get an education. Not everyone can change their mind, their skills, their mindsets simply with the help of the school system. If you believe in these premises, then you can also understand a little better how somebody faced with new technologies that were bound to change society in a deep way because they could foresee that soon enough those technologies would be widespread everywhere on the globe, you can understand how they might be skeptical and think we'd better slow down with the introduction of technologies or even give up on the, on the adoption of the most extreme technologies because otherwise we'll lose ourselves, because society is not ready, because a lot of people in society are not equipped with the skills to handle existence within this new technological ecosystem, and they cannot be educated to adapt. That was the belief of so many, and that's how you can justify and understand this moralistic view of new technology saying, we're doomed. People cannot react appropriately. And there are two alternatives. One is to have the government control the technologies, or at the very least, have the government exercise an appropriate form of guidance, training, and education so that citizens faced with these changes, technical, technological, that will soon become social changes, will still behave. So it's a very moralistic and also a conservative view of society where you can see how the most important value appears to be progress, but it isn't. The most important value on top of the hierarchy of values is really order, compliance with rules and regulations, control of the situation. And the most feared thing is not lack of progress, lack of growth. Rather, it is loss of control, anarchy in society, any kind of entropy happening at such a quick pace that the government cannot follow up with the proper boundaries in place and therefore who knows what kind of social revolutions might occur if this kind of technological progress happens too quickly. And it may be easy for us to judge those in the past, the writer, his readers, this kind of mindset. However, try to think 
of the current situation and how we probably, many of us might welcome the control by the government in certain areas of technological developments, areas such as genetics or biological studies, especially when it comes to added functions, right? You've heard those uh, terms, that phrase, and speculations about the origin of COVID-19, but certainly even if you think COVID-19 had a natural origin, and then there is no evidence of the contrary, not sufficient evidence for sure, we know that uh, those kind, kinds of uh, research projects on adding functions to viruses are still going on as we speak. But there are other prospects. There are other discussions going on in society, right? You may be aware how in England, in areas of England and other countries as well, there is an ongoing debate about limiting the use of the technology of your smartphone in schools. So the moment we are talking about control by the government, and it seems such a remote concept or antiquated, old fashioned, obsolete, we're still in the midst of that kind of discussion. Because control means also the possibility of local or national governments saying kids should not be allowed to take or to use a smartphone during school hours. And this could be extended to the university. There, is a, there are discussions about limiting the exposure of kids to the internet. So what if a local government or a national government introduced the rule saying kids should not be on the internet more than two hours? Per day. So in one form or another, what you see being represented here has a continuation in modern times, right? So keep in mind the connection. It, we're not so disconnected. We're not in a position to simply scoff at this and say, what an antiquated way to deal with that. Now, in order to understand better the themes and the moralistic views of the novel The Master of the World by Jules Verne from 1904, we'll be doing two things this week. One is, starting today, we're looking at the text and its style, its structure at the lowest level to understand how these views and the main themes of the novel emerge from the text, which is also one way for us to learn something that goes beyond the purpose and the focus of the class. That is to say, how you, do you read a text and understand it? How do you analyze a text? Not coming up with opinion about, opinions about the text, but interpreting the text, going from the formulation of a passage to the identification of the messages and the themes in that passage. So I will offer some examples today in reference to the first part of the novel, and then there will be an in-class activity that we'll do together and that will prepare you for the next written assignment that is due at the end of next week, October 4th. On Thursday, I will add a few things on a text that is not part of the readings, but just so that you understand how these moralistic views and condemnation of the automotive technology as dangerous to society, as too big a risk to the good order and harmony of society was not unique to Jules Verne. And especially at the beginning of this technology, you find a lot of texts proposing this idea. And uh, I'll, I'll be talking about an interesting novel published in 1905, but maybe it came out at the end of 1904. You know how in the past, the date of publication is not always faithful. Um, 
and it's called the black motor car takes place in England uh, where again we find this diabolical machine cap capable of incredible speeds being used by an evil inventor who's also a thief a murderer and someone who appears to be able to show up anywhere in England and move rapidly thanks to this vehicle and it must be stopped and the technology must be destroyed. On Thursday we will start a new film and I will introduce the themes and compare this film to the other two we've seen so far to show some thematic trends in the development of the characters. It's a very nice horror film from 1983 directed by John Carpenter, a master of that genre. It's called Christine. Christine is also, it's based on a novel by uh, Stephen King and in fact it was so popular that they've been talking about a remake Sony optioned the film for a remake that was supposed to come out two years ago, last year, maybe next year will be uh, the, the year they come out with the movie. Christine is the name of a car who seems to be possessed by an evil spirit and has a nefarious effect on whoever owns and uses interact with the car. It's a horror movie but from the 1980s so don't be afraid it's not as scary or as gory as horror films are today. In, in, in some scenes it almost looks feels like a dark comedy and it's very well uh, acted. During the weekend I finished the review and grading of the second assignment and all of the participation notes that you've completed so far. As usual, if you go to your Google Docs file, that's where you will find comments and grades for the assignments, comments and assessments for the participation notes. I put everything there, even, if you com even though you completed your notes in class, my comments are in there and let me know if you need any help with the assignments. This is the next assignment. We can review it as well on, on Thursday, but it's based on the lecture of today and the class activity of this week so that whatever you find that is relevant, useful in the class activity, you can transport and reuse in your assignment and during the class activity you can ask questions so that you're ready to work on this assignment. It's due Friday of next week. The title is Fast Technologies. I call it Fast Technologies because it's not just an automobile between fear and fascination and your goal is to find just a few good examples. Two or three should be sufficient in the text showing how the main character, the federal agent by the name of John Strzok, who has been kidnapped and taken on board the terror, this, this vehicle, this magical uh, vehicle with incredible features, how much he is seduced by the technology, by the powers built into the technology, and how much he becomes aware of the dangers and risks connected to this particular technologies. And with the help of just a few key examples, develop a short discussion. The idea is not to make it a mini review of the book, okay? So don't spend too much time about with, with a long paragraph of introduction or a conclusion where you summarize what you said. It's just three to six hundred words, one or two pages, right? What makes or breaks your assignment is how good, how strong are your examples and how good you, is your discussion of the examples to articulate the theme, the presentation of the theme. And 
I don't expect you to be adding footnotes, primary and secondary sources, other than the novel by Verne and the notes from the class, the readings from the class. So I do recommend that you complete the readings before the assignment so that in your discussion you can show your understanding of those readings. Today's presentation is this one you see. So the examples I'm showing you today come from this presentation called The Master of the World Notes and Quotes that you find under Wi-Fi. Okay? And the main points are here. In terms of style, in order to understand the style of Jules Verne, you can refer to these three techniques or rhetorical devices, which are in fact not unique to Jules Verne. You can find them in films, in novels of today. You can find them in many forms of propaganda. I call them speculation, amplification, and accumulation. Amplification would be any kind of hyperbolic language. So saying about this vehicle that is extraordinarily fast, extremely fast, would be a form of amplification. As fast as, as a lightning bolt, that would be an example of amplification. Accumulation would be basically the same communicative function achieved by multiplying the number of adjectives, expressions or phrases to say the same thing. So if I'm talking about the fantastic speed of this vehicle, I can say that this vehicle is quick, is fast, and add other synonyms is as fast as something, but it's a series of qualifiers. And speculation is typical of any kind of commercial literature, literature of entertainment, especially during the 19th and the 20th century, but you can still find it. Speculation is whenever the narrative stops, and instead of showing you the next scene and what happens, the narrator, whoever is narrating the story, stops to contemplate the possible outcomes, the possible conclusions, or the various ways that the story could develop. And we'll see examples, but you know how this kind of technique both expands the narrative and also creates tension through doubt, right? But because if you take your typical action film, when you have Jason Bourne or uh, the character in Mission Impossible, who's about to chase after the bad guys, jump from a building to another, there is no stopping to speculate what will happen. Right? There is no stopping to let you consider how Jason Bourne or Tom Cruise, Tom Cruise's character, might end up. Will they fall? Will they hit the wall or get through the window and continue running or get to the other side and continue running on top of the roof or on top of a train? Right? There is no stopping to consider the consequences because that's an action narrative. And an action narrative is usually action-packed. There might be pauses, there might be scenes where the character brings some reflection on their lives, right? Saying, oh, what kind of life so full of risk, or I couldn't have a family, I couldn't have a relationship because I work for this secret organization, etc. But in terms of the actual development of the story, there is no stopping. In other kinds of narrative, instead, exactly this thing happens. Stopping to consider what might be the cause of signs, premonitions that have appeared at the beginning of the book, for example. 
going back to amplification and accumulation, I, I cannot avoid pointing you in the direction of examples you find right now in the media. Because when you consider the campaign by the two presidential candidates, although they both use amplification and accumulation because the rhetoric of a presidential campaign is aggrandizing oneself, right? But you can also see how each candidate separately is easily associated with one or the other of these two techniques, where amplification is typical of Donald Trump, right? Whenever he says, my presidency was tremendous. The economy was tremendous. Never seen such a good economy under a president since, I don't know, Roosevelt or any, any other model, right? So he has a preference clearly for amplification, using adjectives that depict in a positive, very positive way what he's doing, whereas Kamala Harris is often resorting to the use of accumulation. She's expanding the same concept with a series of expressions or a series of adjectives or a series of phrases when she talks about dreams, aspirations, ambitions. They're pretty much the same thing, right? It's part of this communicative process that relies on emphasis. It, it's a form of emphasis, right? And, and certainly the narrative we're reading is full of emphasis to a fault, okay? What do we find? And after this slide, we'll get into the analysis of passages. What do we find? What do we have to look for in these passages? The negative representation of technology comes through the emphasis given to themes such as lack of control, loss of control, right? The inability of the citizens of this area faced with the signs, the premonitions of this new technology that is being tested and being developed in the vicinity of their town, Morgantown, don't know how to react, don't have the proper guidance from the leadership, right? There's always this conservative desire to have someone because the people are, are so immature and, and especially the lower you go in society, people are so ill-equipped to face any crisis. You need the leadership to guide them properly. But if the leadership itself is not able to control the technology because the, control, the technology is owned and operated by a madman, by an evil inventor, then you see how there is the possibility of real chaos and the sense of powerlessness, meaning we cannot stop it. Even when later on they understand what it is, there is nothing they can do about it. And of course, loss of power goes back to the theme of appropriate leadership in society. This part of the novel is what I've called in my three-act structure, anticipation. And anticipation in a negative way, because this is a negative representation of technology, is done through premonition and ominous signs. That is to say, signs of doom. Signs of changes that are dangerous, threatening the fabric of society or the very lives of citizens. A lot of references to fear in the minds of the people, fear taking over the minds of the people, loss of control, even at the individual level. The citizens cannot be obedient and productive if they're afraid of something, if their minds are taken by fear. And again, we're talking about technologies, but think of nowadays, right? Think about the reactions of the markets to signs of crisis, signs of war, uh, pandemics, etc. Danger, of course, is present and surprise in a negative way. A surprise that comes with a shock. Plenty of negative emotions, negative behaviors, 
without negative behaviors, all the behaviors that are not productive, that are not conducive to social harmony or economic growth. This happens at the individual level, at the social level, and the fact that the technology is mysterious, hence to the dark nature of the core of this new technology. And of course, the implication is that perhaps we should reject this technology because of the risks involved, right? And let's look at some of the passages. This is the beginning of the story, which is so interesting because the premise to the whole narrative is that this is a true story. And that the character who's telling the story is saying, you should believe it because I am telling you this and I was there. I experienced the technology, right? Let's read it together. In the remarkable passages of the recital of, of this narrative, it is important that you, the readers, should believe my word. For some of the facts, I can bring no other testimony than my own. If you do not wish to believe me, so be it. I can scarce believe it all myself. Now, first of all, why do you need to believe the narrative? Usually you read a book, a commercial book, to be entertained, to have a good time, to escape. But if the narrating voice tells you, you need to believe it, this is done to emphasize that this is not just escape literature, that there is a moral message. And any kind of moral message will be strengthened if you suspend disbelief. Of course, the author knows that this is fiction. <clears throat> and of course, the author knows that you will not believe in the existence of John Straw, the federal agent who's telling you the story. However, suspension of disbelief is the agreement between whoever composed a story for a film or a book and the spectator or the reader, so that the message will come out stronger, more impactful. And in fact, this kind of premise is quite common in all kinds of classical literature. On the side, for example, of the Greek or Roman civilization, keep in mind the books that were written by Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar, first a military leader, then a political leader who became the leader of Rome and might have become king or the first emperor if he were not killed in 44 BC, he wrote two books, one about his military campaigns in Gallia, modern France, and the other about his coup d'etat, about his uh, campaign, military and political, to uh, get control of the government of Rome. And they're both based on the premise, this is the truth, because I, Caesar, was there. And therefore, you should believe me, because I was the protagonist of these historical events. And based on that premise, the whole style of his books changes. He's aware that he's not writing historiography, books written by historian. No, he's writing a book from the point of view of the protagonist of momentous political and historical events. And then, of course, from examples such as this, from the Greek or Roman culture, you can easily go to the Bible, right? Take the Gospel of John, for example. After the first philosophical intro, the next chapter and the first episode in the life of Jesus that is narrated is the encounter of Jesus with Andrea and uh, uh, Andrea uh, with uh, Andrew and, and Simon with two of the apostles meaning 
all of this should be believed because there is a continuity for the sources from Jesus to the apostles to the author of the gospel. Okay, so this has to be believed because it comes from eyewitnesses. And again, it's a rhetorical device. It's not assuming that you believe this to be something other than a novel. But it's telling you how you should read it. Okay? Believe my word, because this way, the lesson you take from this will have more of an impact on your life. And I can bring no other testimony of my own means I'm bringing my own testimony. I was the eyewitness to these things, so you should believe me. And this instead is the first signs that a new technology called the terror, this new machine, has entered the landscape of a North American... Uh, region in a region in North Carolina. So this is the beginning of the experience of a new ecosystem. So there are two forms of exposure to the technology. One is John Strzok, the federal agent, being taken on board the technology and going for a long trip, seeing what this vessel is able to do. And the other is the people who are in the same context, in the same ecosystem, and how this technology introduced in their peaceful, productive, harmonious ecosystem, the consequences that are produced. So, all the signs come from this mountain called the Great Erie, which was made up by uh, Jules Verne, doesn't exist, and This is a, a good example of speculation. And the passage explores the possibilities that all the signs are not related to a new technology, but rather to this mountain being a dormant volcano and being on the brink of a new eruption. In brief. Was not this the site of an ancient volcano? One which had slept to the ages, but whose inner fires might yet reawake. And notice how each hypothesis is explored at length to add to the tension and deceive the reader in a way. But it's a game with the reader because you know that it cannot be just this. Might not the Great Erie reproduce in its neighborhood the violence of Mount Krakatoa? Krakatoa uh, was the site of a volcanic eruption in 1883 that was felt throughout the world. In fact, the ashes um, produced a uh, decrease in uh, um, sun rays reaching the earth for a whole year. Or the terrible disaster of Mount Pelé. Mount Pelé was in the French Antilles, La Martinique, in 1902, an entire town, Saint Pierre with tens of thousands of people suffered the consequences of this eruption. So, speculation, all kinds of hypotheses, and accumulation, because it's not just one. It's not introduced as one statement, this could be a volcano. No, through examples, through details, this idea is replicated over and over again, producing this sense of emphasis through accumulation. If there were indeed a central lake, yet another hypothesis is being speculated upon, was there not danger that its water penetrating the strata beneath would be turned into steam? And all the consequences, the scientific stages of an eruption are explored with more references to disaster, deluging the fair plains of Carolina, an eruption such, such as that of 1902, which is in fact Mount Pelé, and on the class wiki you can click on those links and learn more about those events, which everybody in the world at that time was 
familiar with. Now we come to the list of signs. And of course, they're all negative signs pointing to something dangerous, right? Smoke, subterranean noises, unexplainable ramblings. And of course, we'll learn later on that all of this has to do with, one, the construction of the terror, the vessel created, invented by a robber, and the testing of the vessel itself. A glow in the sky is another symptom. But again, a worrisome, a concerning symptom. And then in terms of lack of control and a reflection that should induce humility in the reader, you have this as one of several passages where they're saying, we cannot know for sure because humans have limitations. And in their natural limitations, humans have never been able to climb this particular mountain because of how steep and difficult the rocks around this great Erie, this ancient volcano, are, right? So consider the message infused in here, indeed, and the implications. The implications are these. This is the natural status of humanity. Human creatures need to have natural limitations. It is not completely natural to overcome those limitations, all of them with technologies. And there is this idea, which is pretty much mythical, biblical, right? It's like the Tower of Babel trying to go up in the sky to rival the power of God and being punished for one's hubris, excessive ambition. And the same is here, right? There are mountains, there are places on earth that haven't been explored because we're limited, and that's fine. We don't need mobility-related technologies to explore those areas. Now, there is an attempt to use some technology to overcome that limitation, but everything they have available is failing because what they have is simply an hot air balloon that will go up and then hope to be pushed by the wind and drift over the volcano and then look with a telescope and see if inside the crater there are signs of an eruption, signs that this volcano has reawakened. Of course, this attempt with a hot air balloon fails because that is the, with the technology that is within reach Whereas the terror, the vehicle invented by Robert, goes beyond, in, in a big way, beyond the existing technologies. People react badly to this. And lack of proper leadership, the media also align with the reactions of the people. The media fail to control the minds of the people in a positive way, educating them. So, strange phenomenon, provoke this reaction, people become seriously disquieted. Not just disquieted, seriously disquieted. And the disquiet was joined by an imperious need of knowing the true condition of the mountain. The Carolina newspapers had flaring headlines. You can see the emphasis in the style. <laughs> the mystery of the Great Erie. They asked if it wasn't dangerous to dwell in such a region, right? The, the newspapers are suggesting that people flee their homes and their commercial activities. So all of this is quite dangerous altogether. Their articles arouse curiosity and fear, whereas proper media uh, agency means to keep people uh, uh, in, in their state of quiet and able to conduct their orderly existence. So curiosity among those who've been in no danger themselves were interested in the disturbance merely as a strange phenomenon of nature. But this goes back to the idea that nature cannot be controlled necessarily by humans. Fear in those who are likely to be the victims, so the locals, 
if a catastrophe actually occurred. And notice the use of catastrophe, right? More signs. And the more signs you have, and of course, the more you're supposed to be worried because the signs are multiplying, but we're nowhere near the truth of what these signs point to. Fresh rumblings, but again, this is the construction and the operation of the machine. Heavy clouds, this is any kind of smokes from the chemicals used and the processes used to build the vessel, the vehicle. Unwavering glimmerings of light at night. Folk began to realize, notice folk, we're talking to the populace. Folk began to realize that the Great Erie was serious, perhaps imminent, source of danger. Yes, the entire country lay under the threat of some seismic or volcanic disaster. During the first days of April of that year, where in 1903, these more or less vague apprehensions, vague because no one has made an effort to educate the people, turned to actual panic. So society is on the verge of chaos. But why? You have the context of a peaceful North Carolina town working the rural uh, grounds around the town, and you introduce the technology in this ecosystem, and the disruption interferes with the peaceful and productive existence of the people. Newspaper gave prompt echo to the public terror. Again, they're responsible for this fear. Sure that the eruption was at hand, the, and then one night, April 4, the people of Pleasant Garden, which is a smaller town near Morgantown, are awakened by a strong noise. And they think at this point, they're sure the mountains are falling upon them, which is a kind of language suggestive of the primitive ancestral reactions of the people. They rushed from their houses, rushed, chaos, ready for eastern flight, fearing to see open before them some immense abyss. They think they'll, be, uh, uh, they'll end up inside uh, the earth and, and with burning lava underneath them. Of course, it's very dark at night. No response to the cries, meaning there is no one to take the lead and reassure the people, right? Lack of leadership on the ground. Frightened groups of men, women, children grope their way through the black roads in wild confusion. From every quarter came the screaming voices. It is an earthquake. It is an eruption. Whence comes it? from the Great Erie. Had a fire spontaneously broke out. And again, we get into speculation to add to the tension so that you're distant from the discovery of what it is, but in the meantime, you have all kinds of doubts about it. And to what cause was it due? Lightning, fire, flames, and then an eruption, an eruption. But this is just a panic. The cry resounded from all sides, an eruption. And again, they revisit the hypothesis that this is a volcano. They revisit the stages of an eruption. But look how many times this has been done just to emphasize lack of control over these phenomena, lack of knowledge, lack of leadership at, at organizing the reaction. Okay? And in terms of accumulation, the annihilation of towns, villages, farms, meadows, fields, and forests. Right? Everything is emphatic in a very simplistic way. Nothing could stop it. Women carried, ca carrying their infants, crazed with terror. Right, And again, the assumption is that the populace is made of men and women who don't have a mind that can think rationally. They're easily swayed. They're easily taken over by uh, deep fears because of their simple nature, right? So they need the leadership of educated, smarter people who can take care of them, reassure them. The women with the influence, the men deserting their homes, so men are not behaving like men, right? 
they're not the leader of the house. They're not uh, abiding by the responsibilities of their roles. Again, these are members of the populace. They take all their stuff and they free the animals, the livestock, the cows, the sheep, the pigs. But you see how this produces an interference with the productivity of society and the animals themselves fled in all direction, adding to the confusion, not to mention that the next day you don't have cows to milk and animals to take to pasture. And all the circumstances are being rehashed over and over again to confirm that the technology has such a disruptive influence on this kind of ecosystem, right? I don't have to read all the passages, but you can find them in the presentation called Notes and Quotes. Now, there is some leadership, not enough to resolve the situation, but just enough to show you what they would have needed. And you cannot expect the populace to have a lot of leaders because the populace are made of simpletons in this kind of social model which means someone else from the middle and upper classes should have been there to provide their educated guidance and leadership. Nevertheless, some of the chief and shrewder farm owners were not swept away in this mad flight, which they did their best to restrain. The italics are my comments, by the way. So these are the natural leaders, not the leaders placed there by society, the mayor, the police, the army, etc. But the farmers, some of the farmers. So they see the flames, they, they have some considerations, but that might generate fear. However, they look at this with a pragmatic, rational view that the others are not able to elevate themselves to. There are no stones flying, so no eruption. There is no lava flowing, so it's not an eruption. There are no rumblings from the ground, so it's not a volcanic phenomenon. There was no further manifestation of any seismic disturbance capable of overwhelming the land so they can go home, right? Later on, from the natural phenomena pointing to a volcano, we come to another range of phenomena that go almost unnoticed and these are the first flights of the vehicle and they are not so conspicuous but there are signs, noises, apparitions that signal the presence of this technology in the area. A strange noise swept across the air, sort of weary because if you remember the vehicle has flapping wings accompanied by the beating of mighty wings, the wearing could be the electrical engines, actually. And had it been a clear day, perhaps the farmers would have seen the passage of a mighty bird of prey. This was often the description of even of the earliest plains. Some monster of the sky, which having risen from the Great Erie, sped away towards the east. So we know that this is the technology producing the signs discussed at length before. What are the characteristics of this technology? An extraordinary vehicle, extraordinary because we have amplification in the language, right? In the adjectives, choice of adjectives, of which no one could describe the form, the nature, the size, so rapidly did it rush past, right? It goes by so quickly that you cannot make out the size or the shape. It was an automobile. All were agreed on that. In fact, it's not just an automobile. But as to what motor drove it, only imagination could say. And when the popular imagination is aroused, what limit is there to its hypothesis? Again, a reference to the populace and their simple minds. And then it goes on to discuss that existing automobiles. Notice what we said before. During this time, the market circulating vehicles were about a third, a third, and a third steam-powered, internal combustion engine-powered electricity, electrical engine-powered, and, and says the vehicles from the period could not accomplish more 
much more than 60 miles an hour, if, if that much in 1904, 1903 actually, the, the time of this uh, narrative. And instead, this vehicle appears to be going at about 150 miles, which becomes an incredible speed, such, a, such, as, such that you cannot even see it uh, uh, go by. And extreme danger on the high roads, interference, disruption, danger for vehicles, pedestrians. And notice this, this Russian mass coming like a thunderbolt preceded by a formidable rumbling, caused a whirlwind which tore the branches from the trees along the road, terrified the animals browsing in adjoining fields. So all the signs point to disruption, interference with the regular dealings of the people from the area. And there is this idea connected with speed. The idea that Predominant during the period, the idea that speed changes the laws of physics, such as the vehicle is so quick that it barely leaves a scar on the ground, a sign, a trace on the ground. That speed has an effect on its mass, that matter changes at speed, as if this were the speed of light, right? And you have the description here. The surface of the roads were scarcely even scratched, left behind no such rats, the, the tracks left by wheels, because this is what people were familiar with. Carriages would leave these rats. If you go to Rome in the uh, uh, Roman Forum, you will still find on the pavement, on the stones, the rats left uh, by the carriages going through it. A mere brushing of the dust, Light touch, tremendous speed, whirlwinds of dust, all kinds of emphatic language. And you have even a newspaper saying the extreme rapidity of motion destroys the weight. Again, the laws of physics change with speed. We're talking about a modern science that is impossible to fathom, right? But again, everything is negative because this mad speed threatened to overthrow and destroy everything. Equipages and people. How could it be stopped? No one knew. Loss of control. It's impossible to control the technology and therefore it's impossible to manage the consequences. They don't know what is the engine that propels the vehicle. And of course, as I said, has to do with electricity and there is an abundance of electricity because apparently the vehicle is uh, getting electricity out of the air itself. Okay, the public imagination, highly excited because this is the nature of most people. They're too excitable. And again, it's not just the technology. They believe this to be supernatural driven by a specter, by one of the shuffers of hell, a demon, a goblin from another world, a monster escaped from some mythological menagerie, in short, the devil in person, who could defy all human intervention, having at this command invisible and infinite satanic powers. But similar representations of the automobile can be found in other short stories, literature from the period. And look, if, in case the reader hasn't gotten the message yet, a clear, direct, explicit reference to lack of control by the legal system, right? Because this person doesn't have a permit, there is no number of his car, instead of license plates, people often would have, depending on the area, a number on the car, because there weren't so many number uh, cars in 1903, so you might have the number 44, because in your county, your car was the 44th introduced there, etc. Right? Public security demanded that some means be found to unmask the secret of this terrible chauffeur, right? They, they want to control this. And first, it was matter that changed because of the speed. Now, it's the notion of space itself. 
the vehicle is so fast that it becomes ubiquitous, meaning that it's everywhere. It's not moving from point A to point B like you do in real life. It can be everywhere at once. Kentucky, Ohio, Tennessee, Missouri, Illinois, right? Sightings abound in the most distant places. And again, public danger is the consequence of this. So, we can actually start working on the class activity today, but keep in mind that you'll need more time and we'll continue with the class activity on Thursday. So I'll tell you what we can do today and how we can continue. This time, I would like you to use your Google Docs file. If you have a computer, a tablet here, or if you can sit next to someone with a computer and a tablet, you'll be able not only to write the notes on your Google Docs file, and if there are two of you, just add both of your names there, but you'll be able, more importantly, to copy and paste some passages so that you can add your commentary, because the class activity is not like the assignment, it's not uh, so polished and, and well-structured. It's just notes that you gather in preparation for your assignment, okay? So, this is a text we're working on. So, I did my work on one set of pages, excerpts, but you'll be working on another set called The Terror. This is the chapters, the part of the book where the main good guy, the federal agent, is taken on board the vehicle and experiences the technology. So make sure you find the correct set of readings to work on this activity. And then focus on the following. And the first part for you, especially today, would be to find some good examples of the following. Just read the text and find good example that prove this with great evidence. The fascination of the main character, the federal agent John Strzok, how he's fascinating with the technology, right? And a corollary of this is that he becomes a secret admirer of the evil guy, right? He has respect for this inventor who has created this brilliant technology. And the opposite, fear and fascination. Fascin find at least one example, perhaps two, of fascination. Good examples, meaning don't stop at the first example you find. Go through the narrative and then select more than two or three and then just dump the others and stick with one or two. Examples of the opposite, the fear of technology. His realization that this technology is too powerful for humanity, for regular humanity, for the populace, right? And therefore that this machine and its inventors must be stopped, okay? My suggestion is to focus especially on these chapters, but it's fine, it's up to you, as long as you are in here, okay? So the class activity would be first find very good examples. Possibly copy key passages inside your Google Docs. Or, again, if you're doing it with another student, just put it in one file and add both of your names. From the selection of the comments, the next stage, which could possibly be next class on Thursday, to add a short analysis. Comments that are specific to the text, specific to the language. Not just, I see this as a good example of fear, but where do you see the fear? What are the adjectives, the phrases that communicate that for the character? Okay? Now, as I said, my suggestion is use a computer or a portable device, especially because you'll be able to copy the passages but in case you don't have one, I also have pages, so let me know if you rather work by yourself and write your examples in here. Just let me know and I can bring a copy to you.